Well, we have started last week a, a two-week series on, on barren to fruitful. And we talked a little bit about Rebecca and, and how she, at the end, and how she gave birth to a set of twins and how they were wrestling even within her womb and how Jacob had, had taken the hold of, of Esau's heel even as they were coming through the birthing canal and they were jockeying for position. And even still with that, throughout their lives, that never stopped, that com competitiveness, that, that between those two, it always was that rivalry of the brothers was always there. Most of you are familiar with how Jacob had swindled Esau from his birthright by taking advantage of him when he was in a, a weakened state. When we're tired and hungry and worn out or sad or feeling down or grieving in these moments, as we have to be make sure that we are all the more vigilant because that is when the enemy can try to come in and steal your joy or, or to tempt you, cause you to stumble, present you with a compromising position or situation. But we have the word to rely upon. Jesus was tempted by the enemy as well. He was tempted at all points yet without sin. So he gave us an example where the enemy literally took him and, and tempted him right before he began his ministry. And I would be encouraged to you that if you are going through, there's something else I saw this week, if you're going through things and you're, the, you're feeling challenged, recognize the fact that the Lord is preparing you for something new. And the enemy, even though he can't see into the future because he's not omniscient, which I'm, I'm grateful for, he's not omniscient, he's not omnipresent, he's not creative, he has no idea what's coming, but he can sense when there's things brewing, when the Lord is prepping us for things, be prepared for obstacles to come our way. He wants to throw anything he possibly can to trip you up, to cause you to stumble, to not achieve what the Lord has for you. So be aware of that. So we're wise to it. Jesus. Jesus was, he spoke to Jesus every single time. Every single time. What would Jesus do? He would go back to the word. And he said, it is written. And then the enemy tried to spin it on him and, and say, isn't it written? But then he misquoted things. And he'll do that to you as well. Twist things. Didn't God tell you, hath God not said? <laughs> the very original sin, hath God not said? So we're wise to this. We have seen for generations his so-called tricks. So we can be aware as to what is going to come our way and be prepared for those moments. Esau, not prepared. He was not ready. Honestly, though, he probably shouldn't have had to be because it was his own brother. Why would he need to be prepared to be tricked or swindled? But his greed will make you do dumb things. Whenever I think about Esau, I always think about one thought, and that was the fact that he sacrificed the permanent on the altar of the temporary. Something that he had for life, he gave up in a moment of weakness and literal hunger. His rationale was, well, what good is a birthright to me? What good is a blessing? What good is my inheritance if I die of starvation? So, might as well just give it up. But he couldn't see beyond that moment. Later on, we see, even unfortunately, with the help of his mother, Rebecca, Jacob also deceives and steals Esau's blessing. But we continue on. The reason why I mention that is because the next individual we want to look at when we're talking about barren, being, going from barren to fruitful, and that is Rachel. So Jacob, in fear after the second time of stealing from his brother, he feared for his life and he takes off. He goes to visit his uncle Laban. And here, Laban has two daughters. One of them is Leah and one of them is Rachel. We know the story. We've spoken on them before, but just as a reminder... When Jacob first meets Rachel, he is floored by her beauty. Very similar to Rebecca. Scripture talks about how Rachel was beautiful to look upon. And it says that Leah was, she was kind or in her eyes. She was meek. Tender, I believe it is. Tender in her eyes. 
She wasn't an aggressive person. But he says to Laban, Jacob says, he says, hey, what do I need to do in order for me to be able to have your daughter Rachel as a wife? So he says, okay, here's what you need to do. You're going to serve me for seven years, and then you can have my daughter's hand. So Jacob does this. He works seven years, and he says, because of my love for her, in the seven years has only seemed as a few days. What a sap. What a sucker. Well, the wedding is arranged, and Laban's daughter is given, notice I said daughter, is given to Jacob only for him to find out after the ceremony is performed that what Laban does, he tricks the tricker. He deceives the deceiver. And he gives the firstborn daughter, Leah, to him because that is what tradition is. You're bad, Jacob, for not knowing the tradition. So he gives Leah in his hand, and, and Jacob finds out, and he says, hey, what have you done to me? You've deceived me all this time. He's probably met his match. You see this? This is all in Genesis 29 if you are taking notes here, but we're just summarizing. So Laban says, okay, well, if you want to have Rachel, our tradition is gives the older daughter, but if you want to have the other one as well, then you have to work for me for another seven years. And so it says after he satisfied her week, then they did that as well. So now he's married to both of these sisters, sister wives, the first episode. Let's turn to Genesis 29 and pick up there in verse 31. Leah is actually one of my favorite people in Scripture. Favorite ladies for sure. When the Lord saw Leah was unloved, he opened her womb. But Rachel was what? Barren going from barren to fruitful. 32, so Leah conceived and bore a son, and she called his name Reuben. For she, she said, the Lord has surely looked upon my affliction. Leah tries so hard to earn the love of Jacob. Reuben, she calls him Reuben because it means behold a son. So she thinks there, it has to be. Here's what will happen. I know Leah wasn't dumb. She knew that Rachel was the favorite. And it says the Lord saw her and opened her womb. And so she says to Jacob, because that's what every guy wanted. They wanted an heir. They wanted a son. She says, behold your son. Literally his name, Reuben. You've got to love me now. I've given you what you wanted. You, I, I've got to have earned your love by now, yes? Reuben. Now, therefore, my husband will love me. 33. Then she conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me a son also, and she named his name Simeon, which means the Lord hears. Then she continues on again and says, she conceives again and says, my husband will be joined with me. If I give him a third son, therefore we're going to call him Levi, which means join, we'll be joined together. And she goes through, and she says, these things. it's got to be at this point, after the first one, it didn't work. And she goes through and says, I'm going to earn this love. And so she's carrying around the weight of these boys, and she says, Reuben, behold your son. Jacob, you've got to love me now, right? But nothing changes. Rachel's still the favorite. So she conceives again after a time and, and she says, here's your second son. Simeon, the Lord has heard me. Have you heard me? Do you even see me? Do you recognize the things that I'm doing for you? She's carrying these weights of trying to earn the love of her husband. And then thirdly, Comes along and she's like, I don't even have another hand. 
What am I going to do with this one? She figures it out. She toils and struggles with it and says, Levi, we'll be joined together now, right? Won't you love me? Won't I be your favorite? Won't I be your chosen one? Because now I've given you three things that you wanted. But nothing changed. You see, Leah wasn't physically barren. But she was emotionally barren. She struggled with trying to earn this. And through this, the Lord stopped me in my tracks. And I recognized some, maybe this is why I like Leah so much. I recognized something inside of me. And I recorded a video and I sent it to my kids. And it's interesting when you have older kids and they have phones, you can do things that you might not necessarily have done in the past because I wanted them to have a record of this. And I said, listen to this. I want you to listen to this when nobody else is around because I want you to hear my words. Your mom and I love you. End of the sentence. Not when you shoot a three-pointer or not when you get a good dig in volleyball or not only when you get an A in your math class. We love you, period. We don't love you less if you don't do the things that you, we don't want you to do or if you disappoint us or if, you, if we're frustrated with you or we discipline you, we don't love you any less and exactly we're actually loving you more in those moments. More importantly, Scripture says, for God so loved said he was the lame lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Even before you were, he loved you. Not because of what you did or were going to do, but because you were you. So you don't have to try to earn his love. It already exists. Don't feel like if I'm good enough, the Lord will love me. It's getting heavy. If, it, if I feel like that if I read my Bible, if I go to church, the Lord will love me more. Oh, if I disappoint him, if I sin, if I fall short, the Lord will love me less. No, it's not transactional like that. And I recognize the fact that I was going through so much of my life being transactional and wanted to be in the favor of people. But God's favor is already upon you. His love is unconditional. So Leah conceives again. She's still carrying the weight of the first three boys. But something changes in her heart. And she says, I'm going to drop the weight of the stress or the worry trying to earn Jacob's love and I'm going to lift up my hands praise you again and again because all that I have is a hallelujah and her fourth son she called Judah which means praise and in that moment she stopped bearing children She didn't have to earn it anymore. She didn't have to keep on doing these things over and over and over. She had the love of the Father, and that's all that mattered. She probably was never going to get the love of Jacob, and she recognized it. But she had the love of the one that only the one that mattered. Later on, she does have three more children, but not for that purposing and the motivation. It was for a different calling. When she recognized she didn't have to earn it any longer, she was free to praise. She went from barren to fruitful 
even in a time when she stopped having children. We might look at her and say, wait a second, she's not fruitful, she stopped having kids. Her perspective, her motivation, everything changed to fruitfulness. Leah. We see in Genesis 30, says that when Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, she's still barren through all of this, she envied her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I will die. Jacob's like, <laughs> clearly I'm not the issue here. Do you, uh, anyway, you get the point. All right, first week, <clears throat> first Sunday kids are here. Um, so his anger was aroused in verse 2 against Rachel and said, am I in place of God who has withheld from you the fruit of the womb. So what happens now is Rachel and Leah, they begin this competition of giving their handmaids back and forth to Jacob. And, and out of this comes all these children. For time's sake, we're not going to go through all that. But I want you to jump down to verse 22. And says, God remembered Rachel. It's not that she was forgotten. To begin with. It's the exact opposite, actually. That word remembered means mindful. Psalm 8, 4, we see, it says, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visit him? It says, I remember it was, I think it was Brother Varner said, that the Lord has a mindful of man. He's mindful of us. He's aware of us. He remembers us. Times when we feel like that we are lost and forgotten and, and so distant and far away, the Lord is mindful of you. And he was mindful of Rachel here. And it says, God listened to her because she, she continued to, to pour herself out. And it says he opened her womb here in verse 22. And the Lord, had, and she conceived and bore a son and said, God has taken away my shame. That's what that word reproach means. She was shame, she felt shame that she wasn't giving birth to sons because all these other, the handmaids and Leah, they were, she was embarrassed. She called his name Joseph, which it means Jehovah has added because the Lord has added to me, another son. He's mindful of us. He's ever in, we are ever in his thoughts. You are ever in his plans. He hears your whispers. He saw Nathaniel when he was leaning on the fig tree and concerned and questioning all the things that he was pondering in his mind. And it says later on when Philip introduced Nathaniel to Jesus, he says, I saw you under the fig tree. In that moment of desperation, in that moment of worry and thinking, the Lord sees us in those moments. Even before you knew it or had any thought of him, the Lord was mindful of you. <laughs> he sees us even when we feel distant and dry, a place of barrenness. He remembers Rachel. Several things go on in the next few chapters, which we are not going to go over today. We're going to jump to chapter 35 and verse 16. And Rachel is actually expecting again, and she is just about to give birth to her second son. It says in verse 16, then they journeyed from Bethel, there was but a little distance to go into Ephrath. And Rachel labored in childbirth, and she was hard, had hard labor. And it came to pass, it was in hard labor that the midwife said to her, Do not fear, you will have this son also. She reassured her that it was going to be a boy. And so it was, as her soul was departing, for she died, that she called his name 
Ben Onai, but his father called, which means the uh, son of my sorrow. But her father, but his father said, "No, his name shall be Benjamin, which means son of my right hand." Out of her barrenness came Joseph, we saw a few chapters back, which in turn saved an entire people from famine and starvation. Out of her barrenness came a fruitfulness that would preserve many. We see other examples of barrenness in Scripture, one being Hannah, who has believed God for a son. She promised to dedicate his life over to a service to the Lord, and Samuel ended up being one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament and anointed, arguably, without question, the greatest king in Israel's history, and that is King David. Her barrenness was, in her barrenness, she was rooted in the Lord. And out of that came her fruitfulness. We see in Judges 13, Samson's mother, you read that passage, you see it says that she... Excuse me, was barren, and she was visited by an angel and said, here's what you're going to do with your son. He is going to live a separated life. If you read the life of Samson, it's a bit tragic, actually. Makes a lot of dumb choices when it comes to women. But he had initially set himself aside to what the Lord had for him. And out of that, Samson's mother and her barrenness was fruitful. You know, a lot of times we say it's not how you start, it's how you end. Samson's story is a bit tragic in how he ends. He had a pretty phenomenal beginning, but he allowed different temptations and different cares of the world to get in the way, and as a result, really lived a life of tragedy. In 2 Kings 4, we see a story of a Shunammite woman. So every time Elisha was in town, what she would do is she... She would prepare a meal for him, and, and she would allow him to come stay at her place. And So at one point, she said, here, what do you do? I prepared a room for you, and, and any time you're in town or coming through, you can stay with us. You know, we'll, we'll house you, we'll feed you, and so forth. And, and with that, she didn't say anything about her desires, anything about her wishes. She, of course, you think we're talking about her today, what do you think she was? She, too, was barren. But what's interesting about this Shunammite woman, who is unnamed, just like saying you're a, a, a Belleville woman, right? Which is where she was from, a Belvinianite. I don't know how you say that. Um, anyways, she doesn't ever say anything to anybody. She doesn't ever say, you know, Elisha, you know, you come, you're the prophet of God. Is there any way? I see it. I'm not going to trip over it. Is there a prophet of God? Are, are, are you going to, are you going to, can you pray for me? Because I, I'm desiring a son. She doesn't say that. She didn't do any of that. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture that the Lord sees her heart's cry, even without it being made known to anyone. And he says to Elisha, or Elisha says to her, this time, very similar, we've heard this before, the Lord's going to visit you this time next year, you'll have a son. And she's like, my husband's an old dried up stick. How is that even possible? To the pure, always pure, by the way. <laughs> and of course the Lord visits her and she gives birth to a son later on though Elisha's passing through and her son gets sick and he dies and what do they do with him? they put him in that upper room where Elisha used to stay and as he's passing through she says hey the son that the Lord blessed me with is he dies so Elisha went up and prayed for him he actually laid face to face with him. Breathe the breath of God right into him. Mm -hmm. He was made alive, brought back to life. Shunammite woman and her secret barrenness had a very public fruitfulness. She trusted God. Finally, the last woman we're going to look at is in the New Testament, if you want to look in Luke chapter 1, we see a woman here. 
Scripture is very highly complimentary of her. It says in verse 5, Now there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah. His wife was the daughter of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well advanced in years. Once again, we see several examples of the barrenness and where the people were well beyond their years of physically being able to produce seed moving forward. And the Lord worked a miracle. Once again, a situation where it seemed like there was no logical way that it would work out, but God said, now I can step in. I'm the God of the impossible. When there's no other way that we can turn, no other place that we can go, like, like Peter said, where else are we going to go? You have the words of life. We have no other way but to trust God right now. So we do that. In our desperation, if we would live in that point and not wait... <laughs> Not wait to the very end when we've tried everything else and then get desperate. But if we would be desperate for the move of the Lord initially and trust Him, we would see His hand move. That's what happened. So it was. While she was serving, or while he was serving, so what happens here is Zacharias gets visited by the Lord and says he's going to have a son. We know the story. She has a son, they name him John, who eventually becomes known as John the Baptist, who paves the way for Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was a weird dude. But it needed to be that type of guy to do and say the things that he was willing to say. He needed to have a little bit of a, a sharp personality to him. Otherwise, there are some people that would not have accepted that would have not have been as bold as he was. Because there were a lot of people that tried to crown him as something that he wasn't. He's like, whoa, whoa, hold on. Now, there's another one who's coming. I'm not even worthy to, to buckle his sandals. Yeah. Out of her barrenness, Elizabeth gives birth to a son who paves the way for the one that would go to the cross. And ultimately change the world. You know what's worse than being in a barren place? Because when you're in a barren place and you're honest about it, you know, Scripture says that the Lord will wish that we are either hot, hot or cold, not somewhere in the middle, not lukewarm. It says if you, you're lukewarm, I'm going to, this is gross, but I'm going to say it for the purpose of Emphasis. He's going to vomit you out of his mouth. It's disgusting to him. Lukewarmness. Don't stand on the fence. Make a decision. He would rather we be all in on the barrenness, at least we're honest about it, than giving a facade of fruitfulness. Walking around as if everything is all together and inside we're just a hot mess putting a facade of righteousness and inside we're filled with dead man's bones. It says in Matthew 23, 27 and 28 in the message version, if you could put that up there please. It says you're hopeless you religious scholars and Pharisees, frauds. You're like a manicured grave plot, grass clipped and flowers bright, but six feet down you're all rotted bones and worm eaten flesh. People look at you like and think you're saints, but beneath that skin, you are total frauds. Given the facade or the appearance of fruitfulness. I want us to turn to Mark 11. Interestingly enough, someone at Bible study mentioned this passage here, and I was like, hold, hold on a second, don't be jump, jumping all over my message on Sunday. But we see in verse 12, now the next day, what happens the previous day, which is what we're going to talk about next week, the triumphal, for a triumphal, triumphant entry. 
But the next day, when they had come out of, from Bethany, he was hungry. What an interesting detail. That the scripture decided just to talk about Jesus being hungry. The humanity that it displays there. He was all God, yet all man. To the point where not only was he tempted, yeah, we get that, tempted all points, yet you all sin, yeah, it's a good thing to say there, Shep, great. But he also was hungry sometimes, just like you are right now. He was hungry. And he looks over and he sees a tree. It says in a distance, he looks over and he sees a fig tree. Now, the interesting thing about this is the fact that it is not in season for figs to be growing. But what happens is, we know for flowering and fruit trees, what happens first? What comes? The blossom, then the fruit. So it has the appearance, it has the blossom. So he walks over to it, he lifts it up and says, oh, what do we have here? Nothing. It was giving off the appearance of fruitfulness. It was being deceptive. But when it was pulled away, when it was the outer layer was taken off, it was exposed as unfruitful and barren. But Jesus curses it. Curses the tree. We see the next day when they come back through, that tree's all dried up. My man Peter, he's the only one who is willing to say anything about it. It's like, hey, Jesus, that tree all dried up. He's like, yeah, that's because I cursed it. I could imagine the disciples were like, you know what? We're not going to mess with Jesus this week. Because you know what happened the previous day after he cursed that tree? That's when he walked into the, te the temple and flipped over the tables. Not only was he disgusted with what they were doing, but what did he say in verse 11, 12? Jesus was hungry. He went to the tree, no figs. Doesn't say that he stopped at McDonald's on the way to the temple. He was still hungry. And then when he saw what was happening, then all of a sudden he went from hungry to being hangry. So he flipped them tables right over. So you, you can imagine the guys being like, hey, next day, why are you asking about that tree? I'm not asking him, you ask him. Are you crazy? You see what he did to that tree? <laughs> you know, turn me into Lot's wife. Over the last two weeks, we've had several examples of women who were rooted in the Lord in their state of desperation and barrenness. Barrenness, they still believe God. As a result, that carried them through. They brought the, it brought them out. They took them to a place of fruitfulness. We end with a warning that he is not looking for fake fruitfulness. He would rather you stay in a place of barrenness than to put up a facade of fruitfulness. At least then he can come in and minister to that dry place in your life. So many walk around putting up a front, and, but when the Lord looks at their heart, he sees emptiness and wanting. 1 Samuel 16, verse 7, in the second portion it says, For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Because sometimes things aren't always as they appear to be on the outside. You may look all put together when you're standing up front, but then when you peel back the layers, you are barren and torn and left wanting. And the Lord doesn't desire to leave us in a place of barrenness, but he wants to bring us to a place of fruitfulness and surrender to him and recognizing the fact that I, I can't earn it. 
Lord, I, I can't earn your love and be in your favor by doing the, all the right things and going to all the right places. But the favor of the Lord's are already upon me, and so I choose to walk in your fruitfulness. Lord, because you desire to bring us from a place from barrenness into fruitfulness. We see barren to fruitful. Lord, I feel so barren and sometimes it feels so dry. Often I wonder, I wonder truly why. Was it the choices I made, the times I chose my way, or was it that I forgot you when I walked through my day? I didn't mean to, didn't mean to be caught up in myself. My relationship with you, Lord, I put it on the shelf. I let distractions drag me far from you. I let my schedule pull me from what I know is true. It wasn't just one step that took me so far away, but it was many, many steps each and every day. Sunday was awesome. I left church feeling so blessed. Monday, though, was different, and I certainly failed the test. Tuesday, I got so busy, and I forgot to say a prayer. Wednesday, I skipped the study because it'll always be there. Thursday was so scheduled, the plan I did forget. Friday was a hard day with the kids. I got upset. Saturday, we were cleaning, and I put it on the shelf. Sunday, I was so tired, a day often needed for one's self. The days, they turned now into weeks, and now I felt so stuck. My heart, my soul, they feel so dry, my feet caught in the muck. The plan, the dream, the wife, the kids, they all take so much time. The job that I am getting next, the ladder I must climb. The house, the car, the ring, the fit, these things my mind distract. I cannot hold up all the plates, cannot keep them intact. When I stop to think of all the things, my heart begins to spasm. When I look across and look to you, it feels like a chasm. It's fallen down from me to you with choices I have made. I think I may have gone too far. I'm living in the shade. Of all decisions that I choose while feeling I'm so free, now this burden, it weighs so much, I need to bow a knee. So many steps I've walked so far that I have run. The steps it takes to get to you, the count it takes is one. You take the weight, the worry, and you always set me free. You said to the heavy laden, why don't, why don't you come to me? My hands, I lift them up today fully in surrender. I am down, done with playing games, no longer a pretender. I make the choice to follow you, surrender to your will. All those pieces that felt so wrong, you fix and you do fulfill. I'm standing on the rock of Christ, on him I will rely. I'm rooted in the one true God, he is my joint supply. Your love was there before I was, not something I can earn. Regardless of how good or bad, to you I can return. Today I make the final choice, to you I'll always run. You made a way for me to come, you did it through your son. What used to feel so arid revived in my pursuit. What used to be so barren, now it's full of fruit. Let's stand. Lord, to pray for all those today that could identify with that feeling of barrenness, 
Lord, we're so grateful that we can, no matter how far we have walked away, how long it has been, Lord, we're so grateful that it only takes one step to return to you, one step of, of surrender. Lord, the truth, the reason why that is the case is because you were always walking and following behind. Even when we thought we were running away, Lord, you are right there. We're grateful for that, Lord. You haven't left us or forsaken us even when we've done it to you. When we said, I want nothing to do with you. When our actions have said, we want nothing to do with you. Lord, you see past that hurt, whatever it is that is causing us to say they'll do those things. And you love us anyway. So Lord, we repent today of those things. Lord, we repent of those things. Lord, we ask for your forgiveness. We're grateful that we have an advocate that ever makes intercession for us. So we say, Lord, forgive us for these things that we've done. These things that have caused there to be such a, a distance between us, oh God. Lord, we, we're feeling heavy. We're feeling the burden. But we're grateful you said, come unto me. And Lord, the next part says, and you'll give us rest. We rest in you today, O oh God. There isn't anything that we can do that would make us more highly in your favor, make you love us more. What a reassurance for that, O oh God. Lord, we don't serve you so that you will love us. Lord, we serve you because you first loved us. And out of that place of gratitude, Lord, we just surrender our lives to you and give it all to you. We thank you for these reminders, O oh God. Lord, throughout this week, cause these words to stir in our hearts. And Lord, once again, Lord, give us a, an additional hunger and thirst for your word as it continues to grow and takes root in our hearts today. We thank you for all these things. We pray it in your precious and mighty name, that mighty name of Jesus. Can you say amen? amen. Have a great week. Don't forget, you are loved.